Good morning. My name is Tom Broadbent. I'm a happily married man to a beautiful wife, Deborah June. Together we have three uh, kids, Ashton, Cassie, and Eartha. Two of them already out. I've been a Christian now for 27 years, come April 2nd. And uh, I've spent uh, my life, uh, the better part of my life, uh, serving the United States Army. Uh, I got about 27, or excuse me, 22 years in the Army uh, with about a five year break in service. My heart really is for ministry. My heart is to speak truth into people's lives. The Bible talks about no greater love than a man has than he lay down his life for his brother. Uh, well, I believe one of the, the, the second greatest illustration of our love is to speak truth into people's lives. Uh, and so today, uh, I hope to speak truth uh, into your lives as I share about what a uh, unhealthy church looks like versus a, a healthy church. Good morning. Today, uh, I'm excited about sharing with you my heart. I'm excited about sharing with you some of the truths of God's Word. And uh, I just want to take a moment real quick uh, to kind of um, share a verse with you that kind of talks about where my heart's at this morning, uh, because today we're going to be talking about uh, an issue that I believe is plaguing churches here in America today. And I, I want to be able to approach the subject uh, in all humility and with, with a heart that really uh, seeks to uh, bring people together and to build unity in the church. The uh, passage I want to look at first to kind of share my heart is found in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, uh, verses 25 through 27. It says, There should be no division in the body, but that the members should have the same care for one another. And if a member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. It is in the spirit of this passage that I really want to kind of focus my attention. And I want to address the churches today much like the Apostle Paul who wrote letters to the early church to provide encouragement, instruction, and in some cases, correction. I want to address the churches here in America, but not just in America, but here in Phoenix City and here in Columbus. Understand that I fully appreciate and take to heart passage in James 3, 3 1, which states that, that not many of us should become teachers for we're held to a stricter accountability. But when I read passages like that found in 2 Peter chapter 2, it talks about there being false prophets out there, even as there are false teachers among us who secretly bring destructive heresies, a false doctrine, if you will, even denying the Lord who brought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. It says many of us will follow their false teachings. And it's this idea that I want to speak to this morning. You see, Satan wants to seek and destroy the believer by distracting us from giving our attentions and our love to God and from being obedient to God's Word. He wants to make us Christians ineffective in the work and the ministry God has for us by destroying our testimony. So this morning I want us to specifically look at what makes an unhealthy church versus what makes a healthy church. Then I want to take a moment to look at some of the benefits of a healthy church, being a part of a healthy church. And time permitting, I'd like to wrap up this morning with a quick look at some four spiritual habits that we as individuals and that we as a church can practice to grow in our walk with Christ. But before we get started, I want us to take a look for a moment at two passages in Scripture. One out of the book of Proverbs and one out of Galatians. Because I want to ensure that I approach this topic and these issues that I'm going to discuss here this morning in all humility. So if you have your Bibles, let us turn to Proverbs chapter 6, and we'll pick up in verse 16. 
It says, these six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination unto God. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift to running the evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and then he caps it off with one who sows discord among the believers. It is important that you understand that my intent here this morning is not to sow discord or cause dissension in the church. But I do want to speak boldly the truth of Scripture into our lives that we can be sure that we are living our lives in accordance with the Scriptures and in accordance with God's will. Now let's look briefly at Galatians 6.1. It says, Brothers, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual... Restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourselves lest you also be tempted. This is a command from Scripture. This command in Scripture, due to political and social climate of much of the world today, is a command that we do not wish to execute in today's church. We would rather look at this command and it just kind of ignore it, sweep it aside, sweep it under the rug, if you will. We don't want to hold somebody accountable. This command to correct our brothers and sisters is one that, that because of tolerance or political correctness, we would, we would rather avoid altogether. Now this morning, although I choose to address some of these serious issues, issues that I believe that are plaguing the churches here in America and in parts of Europe, understand that I do so with a heavy heart, but I hope to do it in a spirit of gentleness. My prayer is that the Lord would use me as a tool in His tool belt, if you will, to help restore folks back into a right relationship with Him. So let us look first at an unhealthy church. Now there are many things that will cause a church to be unhealthy. But what I would like to do this morning is to take a look at a movement that I believe is sweeping our country, that has been sweeping our country for several decades now. I want us to look at the emergent church or the emerging church. What is the emerging church? Where did it come from? What does the emerging church believe? As we contemplate our own theology and look at new and innovative ways that we can reach the lost, are we compromising our core beliefs for the sake of tolerance? Is our methodology in ministry to the younger generation, causing us to forfeit absolute truth for relativism. What does the Bible mean when it talks about the apostasy of the church? Another issue that we'll talk about later in the our, in our sermon. Is the emerging church aiding or contributing to the apostasy of the church by embracing relativism? The answer to each of the above questions show the dangers behind the emergent church who has embraced relativism for the sake of tolerance. Many hold the view that we must hate the sin and love the sinner. And I agree to an extent. However, we do not have to be tolerant of all people at all times in all situations, especially if it forces us to compromise our core beliefs or the absolute truth of God's Word. Paul Eames, in his book, 
the Moody Handbook of Theology is very quick to point out that the theology of the emerging church or the emergent church is still being developed. However, he goes on to say that the two of the founding fathers, a guy by the name of Mark Driscoll and Brian McLaren, part, uh, couldn't even agree on a united doctrine. Driscoll, who was more conservative, eventually parted ways. Whereas McLaren, who became the figurehead for the movement, was considered to be extremely liberal. And it's McLaren's theology that gives us cause for concern as it relates to the validity of what we're teaching the masses as Christian core beliefs. Throughout the movement, we find all sorts of folks from all ends of the spectrum, from conservatives like Driscoll to liberals like McLaren. Then we still have others like Ray Anderson, who argued that the emerging church dates all the way back to Pauline theology, arguing that if we turn to Scripture, much of the New Testament gives credence to the emerging church. It appears that there is such a struggle to establish credibility within the movement, yet thousands have flocked to the new theology with very little understanding of what's really behind it. Case in point, a guy by the name of D.A. Carson illustrated in his book, Becoming Conversant with the Emerging Church, that back in 2003, the National Pastors' Convention and the Emergent Convention took place simultaneously in San Diego. What's troubling is that it's reported that 3,000 pastors from all sorts of denominations attended one or the other. 1,900 attended the National Pastors' Convention. But what's troubling is that 1,100 pastors coming from different denominations, Baptist, Lutheran, Presbyterian, Catholic, you name it, 1,100 pastors attended the Emergent Convention. Despite the fact that the movement was considered amorphous and its boundaries were still ill-defined. So why would 1,100 pastors attend a convention that doesn't even know where it stands biblically. What is the motivation behind this movement? Where did it come from? What does it believe? Well, according to an article written by John Hammett, which was a book review of the work completed by Eddie Gibbs and Ryan Bulger, entitled The Emerging Church, Creating Christian Community in a Postmodern Culture, Hammett articulates three core practices and six additional that are common among those who believe or identify with the emerging church. Identifying with the life of Jesus, transforming in secular space, living as a community, welcoming strangers, serving with generosity, participating as producers, creating as created beings, leading as a body, and taking part in spiritual activities. On the surface, these practices all sound great and noble. However, to answer the above questions and really get to the root of what's at the core of the emerging church and what is their foundational belief system rooted in, we must first look at the beginning with the Founding Fathers. Specifically, we need to look at Brian McLaren, who according to Boer, in his article, Emerging Treason, Politics and Identity in the Emerging Church Movement, he claims that the initial reason for formation in the emerging church was due to a mass exodus of church members. So the motivation for the emerging church stemmed or was motivated by the numbers and not by God. And we'll get back to that more again later. He, said, he goes on to say that 
that due to the mass exodus of church memberships among the younger generation, he says, Boer cites a study completed by uh, David Kinneman as to, as to why there was such a mass exodus. Kinneman claims that among millennials, they've withdrawn from organized religion and evangelical Christianity in particular due to the church being too judgmental, too political, homophobic, and hypocritical. Additionally, a consensus among emerging church leaders are that the church's view on sexuality is too restrictive and that the negative view on homosexuality and premarital sex has had a significant effect on young millennials dropping out of church altogether. We've seen this recently with, with the Presbyterian church that recently came out and stated that as a church, they're going to allow gay pastors, gay marriages, and they were so bold to say that, you know, if you don't like it, tough, go find another church. This view among the emergent church leaders has, such, had, has, has had such a profound effect that it's affected their reasoning altogether. In fact, according to Boer, both McLaren in his book, A New Kind of Christianity, Ten Questions That Are Transforming the Faith, and Scott McKnight in his book, The King, Gospel, uh, uh, the King Jesus Gospel, The Original Good News Revisited, have both stated a need to engage a theological rethinking. This is a, in part why Eames make the assertion that the emergent church embraces relativism and thereby rejects the notion of absolutism in theology, particularly regarding the Scriptures. They just as soon as reject Scripture as a whole. Inns then quotes McLaren, who stated, the last thing I want to do is get into a nauseating argument about why this or that form of theology is right. This is talked about in Scripture. We're warned about this in Scripture. Turn with me briefly to 2 Timothy chapter 4. We read in beginning in verse 3, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. The Bible tells us that this is going to happen, and that we see it happening right before us today in the 21st century. Enns goes on to argue that the leadership of the emerging church will often opt for ambiguity in doctrine, particularly with respect to the Scriptures. We see this in McLaren's theology as both uh, Ron